Now, Rabbi Yossi, who is sitting in the academy and here Rabbi, here's Rabbi Judah saying this, he responds. He says, Rabbi Yossi, uh, or says, Rabbi Yossi, the son of the Damascus woman, said, Judah, my rabbi, why do you twist the scriptures upon us? Heaven and earth testify for me that I am from Damascus, and there is a geographical location named Chadrach. <laughs> He's like, I'm from there, you idiot. There's just a town called Chadrach somewhere. Shalom, I'm Dr. Nehemia Gordon. Shalom, I'm Linnell Gordon. Welcome to... The Palestine Prophecy. So we were doing this study, we, we do these Bible studies in the mornings, and we were going through the book of Zechariah, the book of Zechariah, and we got to chapter 9, verses 1 through 8. And I was like, oh my gosh, this is like happening today, for real? Could that be? We had to stop and realize we need to share this with people, because this is something that very well may be relevant to what's going on in the news today it's as we're recording this. Um, is Zechariah 9 a prophecy that happened in the past that was already fulfilled in the time of Zechariah is, or something that was in his reality of that day? Is it something that was future for his time or is it future for our times? Let's read the whole prophecy and let's, let's figure okay. it out. All right. You'll stop me when it's wrong, right? <laughs> Maybe. Uh, I don't, let's read the whole thing. I mean, one through eight, and then we'll go back. Okay? A pronouncement. The word of Yehovah. Wait, so tell us what translation you're reading. I'm reading the JPS Hebrew English Tanakh. Okay. So, and that's a the 1985 Jewish Publication Society edition uh, or version. So you read that one through eight, and I'll go back and tell you what it really says. <laughs> Okay. That's usually how it goes. That's how our that's how our table talks. And by the way, go. yours doesn't say Yehovah. It actually says Lord, right? It says Lord in capital letters, Which, but it does say okay. Yehovah right here in the Hebrew. It says in the it, Hebrew. Not in it English. says it. So read the English just how it is, and we'll you go back it. and a okay. pronouncement: the word of the Lord. He will reside in the land of Hadrach and Damascus, for all men's eyes will turn to the Lord, like all the tribes of Israel, including Hamath, which borders on it. And Tyre and Sidon, though they are very wise. Tyre has built herself a fortress. She has amassed silver like dust and gold like the mud in the streets. But my Lord will impoverish her. He will defeat her forces at sea, and she herself shall be consumed by fire. Ashkelon shall see it and be frightened. Gaza shall tremble violently, and Ekron at the collapse of her hopes. Kingship shall vanish from Gaza. Ashkelon shall be without inhabitants, and a mongrel people shall settle in Ashdod. I will uproot the grandeur of Philistia, mm. but I will clean out the blood from its mouth and the detestable things from between its teeth. Its survivors too shall belong to our God. They shall become like a clan in Judah, and Ekron shall be like the Jebusites, and I will encamp in my house against armies, against any that come and go, and no oppressor shall ever overrun them again, for I have now taken note with my own eyes. Okay, let's, let's read what it says here. So it starts out masa, a burden. So a masa is a certain type of prophecy, and the word masa, uh, written with a sin, not a samach, literally means uh, something that you carry on your shoulders. Now, what does that mean in, this, in the context of prophecy? It's not entirely clear. But it's a type of prophecy. So this is a, so they say a pronouncement, but it's a, ma, a masa prophecy. The word of Yehovah in the land of Hadrach and Damascus his rest, and we'll come back to what this means. For to Yehovah is the eye of man and all the tribes of Israel, and also Hamat will be have a border for her, and Tyre and Sidon, for she is very wise. And Tyre will build a fortress for her and amass silver-like dust and uh, fine gold like mud in the streets. Behold Adonai, that is Lord, um, behold Adonai will uh, disinherit her and he shall strike this, the, her wealth in the sea and she shall be consumed by fire. Ashkelon will see and be afraid, and Gaza, or Aza in Hebrew, will be very frightened, and Ekron will, um, her 
her look will be ashamed, meaning she'll look down in shame. Uh, and a king uh, or kingship will be lost from Aza, and Ashkelon will no longer be inhabited. Uh, a mamzer, which we'll get to what that means later. A mamzer will dwell in Ashdod, and I will cut off the glory of the Philistines. And I will remove the blood from its mouth and the abomination from between its teeth. And its remnant, he also will be for our God. And he will be like a clan in Judah, and like uh, an Ekron shall be like the Jebusite. And I will encamp for my house against an army from those that pass and return, and no more, never again, I love those words, and never again will an oppressor pass over them, for now I have seen it with my eyes. So that's that's what it says. All right. So you've so, told me yeah. this. You've told me this that mm -hmm. before we do any prophecy, you yeah. said we need context. Yeah. So we gave the context, and then we need, <clears throat> like you said, language, history, language, history, and context. Language. Okay. So yeah, you've given the history. You started. Mm -hmm. You've given the context, yeah. and the language is. Well, and I and I want to go back to the end of chapter eight. So what was the purpose of the end of eight? The purpose, like, why is God giving this prophecy at the end of eight? It's encouraging Israel that's surrounded by nations who want to destroy us. Yeah. And that continues here in chapter 9. So there are these nations who want to destroy us, and he's telling you there'll be a time. And this is really, this was shocking. I mean, this shocked me, shocked me to my core. After what happened on October 7th, when Israel was attacked by, I mean, it's the worst terrorist attack in the history of Israel. I would argue it's the worst terrorist attack in the history of the world. It would, I would agree. And, I, and, you know, people have, have pointed out that imagine if on 9-11, Al-Qaeda actually occupied large swaths of the United States and held on to them for 72 hours and proportionately killed tens of thousands of people, right? Meaning based on the proportion of the population. So Israel had over 1,400 people killed. It wasn't just that. In a country that only has 9 million people. The method that it was done. Oh, I mean, horrific things. Um, things that are, are monstrous. Um, things that I can't talk about because this will be pulled down from some internet outlets. Um, so when that happened, I did not expect to then read this prophecy shortly thereafter. And you'll find out at the end, and you maybe have already heard it, but if you read what it really says, it's very, very surprising. It's very apropos. I think it is. Now that's it's just apropos, me. But it's also shocking that this yeah. is going to be the final outcome. But let's go step by step. So right. we have a burden, a certain type of prophecy, and it says the word of Yehovah in the land of Hadrach. So where's Hadrach? Where's Hadrach? Ah. Well, wait a minute. It says Hadrach and Damascus. We know where Damascus is. And Damascus is rest. And then it also mentions in the next verse Hamat. And then Sor and Sidon, Tyre and Sidon. So we have five, well, four cities. And then we have um, Hadrach, which maybe is a fifth city, although not necessarily. Some people have interpreted Hadrach or Hadrach to be the name of a deity. And so the land of Hadrach would be like saying the land of Chemosh, which would be the land of Moab, or the land of Yehovah, which would be the land of Israel. So um, or Hadrach is the name of a city, possibly. So when Nehemiah goes through this with, yeah. with me, and, yeah. and obviously now, yeah. he goes through a lot of different, he goes through all the possibilities that yeah. exist. He's not telling you what he thinks it is. He might tell you what he thinks it is, but he's telling you what it could be in the context of everything that he knows and everything he's read and everything we've studied. Here are all your possibilities. So guys, when you hear... And maybe not all because we don't have time for that, but well, I'm going to give you the highlights because <laughs> yeah. there's too many possible, so, you know, too many, too much information sometimes that we don't have time to bring it all. Um, so would you talk to them real quick before you finish, but do that as we yeah. go through this, mm -hmm. you you taught me something. One is a plain meaning, and the other is a literal meaning. Right. And, and, and so, all right, so I know Christians will talk a lot about, you know, literal meaning. Like, they'll say, well, I don't, I don't interpret the Bible, I just read it. And Jews hear that, and they literally laugh, because they interpret it any interpretation, it. any reading of it requires an interpretation. Right. Now, what you really mean is you want to interpret it based on what we call in Hebrew the pshat, the plain meaning. Uh, pshat literally means simple or plain meaning. And the pshat is in contrast to a different method of interpretation called drash. Drash is where you ignore the plain meaning very deliberately. Um, so the definition of pshat, the technical definition. Pshat. And it's pe, what is Peshintet. Okay. Or 
E E S H A T. You don't really need the E. Got it. Um, there's a schwa there. Shot. So and drash is D E R A S H. Um, so drash is where you dig down into. Uh, uh, it, it's to seek, and it means to seek a deeper meaning, which isn't the plain meaning. And deeper meaning means it's actually not a meaning that anybody would ever arrive at or could ever arrive at just by um, reading it. They have to um, read meaning into it rather than deriving meaning from it. So the pshat, the plain meaning, is defined as the interpretation based on the language and the context using reason or common sense. Okay. So that's four things. Interpretation based on language and the context using reason. If you invalidate any of those four, I and mean, you can't really validate interpretation because everything is interpretation, but if you invalidate language, context, or common sense, you're now in the field of drash. Okay. Right. Now, why do I say pshat is not the same thing as literal meaning? Because sometimes the pshat is an allegory. Right. There's a famous example where um, uh, Rashi, who is this uh, Jewish commentator in the Middle Ages, uh, Rabbi Shlomo, the son of Isaac, he's in France, um, and he's one of the great commentators of um, medieval Judaism, and he's talking about the book of, uh, of um, Song of Songs, mm -hmm. and he says, Pshutohu mashal. It's plain meaning as an allegory. So what does there that mean? Go. Okay. So it's a man talking about his lover, and then the, then the woman talking about her lover, meaning it's these two um, man and woman who love each other. And in some situations, he's describing different body parts, right? And so what is, why are we being told this? Mm -hmm. That seems very strange to be in the Bible. So going back to the earliest times that we know of, this was interpreted as an allegory. Now, an allegory for what? That depends who's interpreting it. Jews interpreted it usually as an allegory of God talking about Israel. Christians interpreted it as, as God or Jesus talking about the church. Mm -hmm. right? and, and even those have varied in how you, how you implement it. So there's this, this, this incredible, um, uh, there, there's a translation from the Art Scroll. Uh, Art Scroll is this um, company that makes Bible translations. Oh, yeah. Uh, or prints all kinds of books. And in their translation of um, the woman, uh, I forget if it's the man talking about the woman, but we'll put it up here on the screen. Um, he talks about, oh yeah, it's, I think it's the man talking about the um, some of the, um, uh, how do I put this, uh, physical aspects of the woman's body, uh, which come in a pair. And, oh. and, and they translated an art scroll in the text, oh, hi, I love your oral law and your written, and your written law. Do they really? They really do. Something to that effect, I'm okay. paraphrasing. We'll put it up here on the screen. So how do they do that? <clears throat> because they interpret, according to them, yes, he's talking about her bodily uh, parts, but what that the plain meaning of that, according to them, is that it's an allegory for something else. Okay. And, and a better example, because maybe it is about a man and his lover, right? We don't know. Song of Songs. So an example which you really couldn't interpret literally, but it is where it says, circumcise the foreskin of your heart. So that would mean you'd have to cut open your heart and take off foreskin's a little flap, a little extra piece that if you remove it makes it perfect. Um, so imagine if you had to take off. <laughs> I just couldn't stop that. I'm sorry. Imagine if you you said, "Oh, that means to have open heart surgery," and you take off a little extra piece of your heart. And and until the twentieth 20th century, we didn't have the technology to do yeah, open heart perfect. surgery. And now we can finally fulfill the commandment in its literal sense. Okay. But no, that, that is the literal sense, but it's not the pshat. The plain meaning is it means don't be stubborn. Right. And how do I know that? Because the other half of the verse says, and no longer stiffen your neck. Right. And they didn't have open heart surgery. So the historical context tells me it couldn't possibly mean that you need to have open heart surgery. So the question we have here for this prophecy is what is the pshat? And the pshat could be an allegory in some cases. Um, we don't know, right? We're, we're going to bring the different possibilities, maybe not all of them, but many of them. Now, when it comes to Hadrach, or Hadrach, the land of Hadrach, so we know where Damascus is. It's still called today Damascus. Right. We know where Hamat Syria. is. It's the capital of Syria. Back then, it was a kingdom called Aram Damasek, Aramea of Damascus. Right. And there was a second kingdom that today is in Syria. It was called Aram Sova, Aramea of what is today Aleppo. Um, and then you had Hamat, which was a city in between them, 
on the northern border of the kingdom of Damascus. And Hamat is still around. Hamat today is called Homs. It's in northern Syria, right? I'm going to pull it up here, Homs. It's we got to put a map up. Homs. We need a map um, so we can Arabic. show people where these Yeah, are. Homs is in, so here I'm showing you on my map, and we'll put it up on the screen. There's Damascus. Right. And here's Homs. And here's Aleppo. Or Where's Homs? Homs is just in the middle, which is Hamas. Oh, I see, I see. I so see. it's about halfway, roughly, between uh, Damascus and Aleppo. So it's about an and hour then, from... Yeah, I don't know how far it is. Um, it's of No, no, it's much more than an hour from the border of Israel. Um, <clears throat> now, Tyre and Sidon, uh, in Hebrew, Tzol and Sidon, those are still cities today on the coast of um, Lebanon. Lebanon. Okay. And, and we'll get back to Tyre um, later on. But what? So these are four cities that we know about. And then there's Hadrach. What is Hadrach? So there's this really interesting discussion about what Hadrach is in the Talmud. And before we get to that, or not the Talmud, in the Sifre, which is an early Midrash from the 2nd and 3rd century. Mm -hmm. Sifre, Deuteronomy, um, section 1, uh, on the Torah portion of of Devarim. So so before we get to that, we have what's called a methodological problem. And what do I mean by that? So you'll see people, they'll come up with a hypothesis, a theory, about what Chadrach is. And then other people will come along and say, well, we know Chadrach is X, Y, Z. Well, no, whoever said it was X, Y, Z was basically on Zechariah 9.1. You can't then read that back into Zechariah 9.1 and, and, say, and, say, you know what it is? and say, this is how so we know what Hadrach is. How many times is Hadrach in the Bible? Once. And where is it at? Here. This is it. This so is it. we don't have any other places in the Bible that talks about And not Hadrach. just in the Bible. We don't for sure, cert- with great certainty, have, like we can't go today to a map and say, where's Hadrach? We don't have that. It's nowhere, okay. right? Now, there's a place mentioned in Assyrian sources, which is Hataraka, or Hataraka, Hatarika. It's mentioned in the Hebrew and, and um, Aramaic lexicon of the Old Testament, or known as Haloth, right? So it's mentioned in the dictionary. Mm-hmm. Uh, is that Hadrach that we have? Maybe, maybe not. Okay. We don't know for sure. Um, so, because we don't know where Hadrach is, and certainly in ancient times, uh, the rabbis didn't know it. Now, in the time of Zechariah, I'm sure they knew where Hadrach was. Probably. Maybe. But um, the um, a thousand years, 600, 700 years later, 800 years later, when the rabbis were discussing this, they didn't know where it was. And so here's the discussion that takes place. It's a debate between Rabbi Yehuda, Rabbi Judah, and Rabbi Yose. Okay. <clears throat> and these are rabbis who are around the year 150 CE or AD. Rabbi Judah interpreted this verse. Uh, he says, Chadrach refers to the Messiah, who is sharp to the nations and soft to Israel. And so what he does is he takes the word Chadrach and says this is a word made up of two other words, just like Nehemiah means Yah comforts. Chadrach means Chad, sharp, and Rach, soft. Um, is that what it means? That seems very far-fetched to me. <laughs> The land of Chadrach, meaning he understands, let's read it his way, the burden, a burden, the word of Yehovah in the land of the Messiah, and Damascus his rest, who's his? The Messiah, according to Rabbi Yehuda. Okay. Now, Rabbi Yossi, who is sitting in the academy, and here Rabbi, here's Rabbi Judah saying this, he responds. He says, Rabbi Yossi, uh, or it says, Rabbi Yossi, the son of the Damascus woman, said, Judah, my rabbi, Why do you twist the scriptures upon us? Heaven and earth testify for me that I am from Damascus, and there is a geographical location named Chadrach. (laughs) He's like, I'm from there, you idiot. There's just a town called Chadrach somewhere, or a region or a district or something. Okay, Rabbi Yehuda responds, but how do you then interpret in Damascus his rest? That's strange. Why did we, what's the problem with Damascus' rest? Why does that require it to be referring to the Messiah? And the answer is, well, let's read on, let's read Rabbi Yossi's answer and we'll find out. Rabbi Yossi responded, from where do we know that Jerusalem in the future will reach Damascus? As it is written, and Damascus his rest. And there is no rest other than Jerusalem, as it is written, and then he quotes Psalm 132, 14, For Yehovah chose Zion, I will dwell here, for I desire it. This is my rest for all eternity. So menucha, rest, in Hebrew, Rabbi Yosei understands to be a 
a technical term that refers to Jerusalem. And so the way Rabbi Yossi reads it is in the land of Chadrach and Damascus, his rest, meaning Chadrach and Damascus, are now part of Jerusalem. And Rabbi Yehuda um, doesn't seem to really dispute that, that his rest um, refers to Jerusalem. And I don't want to go into the whole thing, but basically the way they understood it was that um, that prophecy can only take place in the land of Israel. That's an idea the ancient rabbis had. Oh. And, if, and, if, and so the one way of reading this is the word of Yehovah is in the land of Chadrach, and Damascus, his rest, who's his, the word of Yehovah, meaning its rest, mm-hmm. right? And so it reaches to Damascus is what they're saying, or is how they're interpreting it. Mm-hmm. And if the word of Yehovah is in Damascus, that means Damascus is part of the land of Israel. So perhaps it means that Yehovah will conquer Syria, that part. I think it definitely means that Damascus will be part of Israel. We don't need to take or it in Israel the direction. The, under Yehovah would rule Syria, that could be a part of it. For sure. No, no. There's, there's almost no question that, as we'll see as we go later in the prophecy, right. Damascus, Tyre, Sidon, and Hadra, wherever that is, will be part of the land of Israel um, when all of mankind, including Israel, look towards Yehovah. Um, let's talk about that for a minute. It says, for to Yehovah is the eye of man and all the tribes of Israel. Right. So the word and is the Hebrew letter Vav. And the Hebrew word letter Vav is... Very dynamic. It's not that it's vague. It has lots of different meanings. No, I said vague. I'm just vague. Oh, v. v. Okay. So the letter vav is very dynamic. It has lots of different meanings, and one of those is and especially. Ah. Oh. So, and the example of that is uh, Solomon loved many wives and the daughter of Pharaoh. Mm, isn't that included in many wives, the daughter of Pharaoh? Right. It means and especially the daughter of Pharaoh. So here it says, for the eyes of man and all Israel are to Yehovah. It means the eye of man and especially all the tribes of Israel are to Yehovah. That's what that means. So all mankind in the future will look to Yehovah, including the nations. And at that time, Damascus will be part of Israel. Now, does it mean Damascus is conquered? Let's leave that, okay? We haven't decided that yet. Um, let's, let's go on to, ver- can we go to verse 2? Or yeah. do you have more questions? No, no, no. I think... Uh... No, I think that's fine. Okay. Um, oh, I want to finish up with verse one. So what's the takeaway from this strange discussion about, you know, he says he interprets it, Chadrach as the Messiah, as, as like the kind of title of the Messiah or something, meaning Chadrach, he would interpret Rabbi Judah, would, Rabbi Judah would interpret Chadrach as the one who is sharp to the nations and soft to Israel, right? The one who comes to judge the nations and, and maybe punish and, and, and smite them. And to Israel, he's soft. Uh, I don't know if that's what the Messiah is going to do or not. We'll find out. Um, so, and Rabbi Yosei responds, this is a ridiculous interpretation. You're twisting scripture upon us, he says. Mm-hmm. What, my takeaway from this debate is, according to both interpretations, this is a messianic prophecy. Okay. Whether Chadrach is a cipher, a title of, for the Messiah, or whether we just understand it as a, as a literal place, we're talking about these places will become part of Israel. And more importantly, all mankind will look to Yehovah. Right. And all of Israel and the eye of man will look to Yehovah. And Damascus will be the place of the rest. And I guess we do need to talk about that. Who's his rest? So it right. could be the word of Yehovah. We talked about that. It could be his rest could be Yehovah himself. Mm-hmm. In the Middle Ages, there's a rabbi named Yosef Kara in the 11th to 12th century France. And he says it's the Shekhinah. Now, what's the Shekhinah? That's what Christians call Shekinah glory. Shekinah glory. Now, really, what is the Shekhinah? So the Shekhinah means the dwelling. And it comes from in the Tanakh, where it says that Yehovah will choose a place where he will cause his name to dwell. And that later becomes Jerusalem in 2 Samuel 24. Um, So the place where Yehovah causes his name to dwell, the word dwelling is Shekhin. And so Shekhinah is the indwelling of the name. In the Tanakh, it doesn't use the word Shekhinah. It's a verb. It causes his name to dwell. Um, It's not a noun. The noun in the Tanakh is Kavod Yehovah, the glory of Yehovah. And that's where Christians, they put the two together and they get Shekhinah glory. right? But in the Hebrew as well, you'd say Shekhinah Kavod. In Christianity, um, that 
I would argue, or I think I would say this, that in Christianity, um, that's the Holy Spirit. That's what I was thinking. When right. You said Meaning that. what is the Shekhinah really? What do Jews mean? We mean it's some way that we can sense Yehovah in a tangible way that we can't, in a, you know, he's infinite. Right. So he's not actually in Jerusalem. He's everywhere. It's, Solomon prays the prayer. The heavens can't hold you and the heavens beyond the heaven can't right. hold you, let alone this house. Right. So why do, what do you mean he causes his name to dwell there? We sense Yehovah in a way in Jerusalem we don't anywhere else in the world. And there's one more way to look at this. Yeah. Uh, uh, could this he be a bad guy? And yeah. his rest is in Damascus. Yeah, it could, it could be the enemy that Yehovah God is going to fight is in Damascus. Prophesying against what Christians the bad call guy. The, it could be what Christians call the Antichrist will be in Damascus. And at that time, all mankind will look to Yehovah, um, who will then defeat this um, this figure who's in Damascus. That's a, totally a possibility. I, I want to finish up the this um, Shekhinah thing. Mm -hmm. So, So the explanation of how do you get Damascus as where the Shekhinah is, the Shekhinah is in Jerusalem, not in Damascus. Right, right. So this goes back to this idea. Um, it's from Deuteronomy 12, 9, where it says, Until now you have not come to the rest in the inherited portion. And rest there, if you see how that plays out from Deuteronomy 12, 9, later in, in, in Kings, and uh, really Joshua through Kings, what you see is that um, when they come to the rest, that is that Jerusalem is the capital of Israel. And right. that's when the temple is built. Right. And so the fulfillment of Deuteronomy 12, 9, where it says, until now you have not come to the rest of the inherited portion, isn't just you go into the land, that you have rest when Jerusalem is finally the capital of Israel. That's how they interpret it. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's definitely how it's understood in, in like I said, in Samuel and, and Kings, right. um, or how it's presented. Um, and in that place, you have Jerusalem as a mega city. A mega city? A mega city? <laughs> it's a mega city. Right. In other words, Jerusalem reaches all the way to Damascus. Um, if you know, you know. Yeah. Um, um, and look, we have in the book of Ezekiel a description of Jerusalem as being much bigger than it is today or having different borders, borders than it did in ancient times. Um, another possibility is that um, the burden prophecy, that is, it starts off Masa, uh -huh. it will apply to Damascus. And that's what it means. It'll rest upon Damascus. Oh. Um, so, so these are a bunch of different possibilities no, that have been suggested over the centuries. There's one more that we were talking about when we talked about the bad guy. There was one more thing that we talked what about. Was that? It. You were talking about uh, maybe it's bad guys in the area of Syria. Well, I'm just going to talk about right now. Who are yeah. the bad guys in the area of city of the city right now? Well, I mean, uh, uh, you know, Syria is ruled by the uh, Assad family, who who treated as their personal fiefdom. Um, you know, the the father died and the son took over. Um, he inherited the country from his father. And when there was a rebellion against him uh, in this civil war, something like 600,000 people so far have been killed. And of course, there's there's protests all over the world for all the innocent uh, civilian Arabs who were killed. No, there's not. Nobody cares. I, I know. I was, right? I they, only cares when, they only care when cares. Jews kill Arabs or Muslims, not when Muslims kill Muslims. So, But there's a civil war right now in Syria, and they're pretty evil, the people in Syria. You wanted me to remind you when we mm -hmm. went through here about yeah. that sneaky story of ISIS um, in the civil war with the Syrian government. Oh, so okay, my yes. my nephew about a number of years back, um, he was serving his uh, regular, right now he's in the reserve duty um, on the, well, I won't say where he is, but um, on the front lines. And, um, but years back when he was doing his regular army service, his three-year stint, he um, was on a fortification facing Syria in the Golan Heights. And to their right, from their from their from the Israeli base, if you look to the right, that was where ISIS was based. Mm -hmm. And if you look to the left, that was um, ISIS's arch enemy, who it was at the time, called the Anusra Front, which was Al-Qaeda. Oh, okay. And we right. think of like, oh, these are you know fundamentalist um, Islamists who want to destroy Western civilization. Well, that's true, but they're also arch enemies against each other, which is hard to fathom. For, uh, for me, it's hard to fathom that you have ISIS's worst enemy isn't America. Its worst enemy is actually Al-Qaeda or the Al-Qaeda affiliate that was in Syria called on Nusra Front. So um, what the terrorists on both sides would do is they would sneak out of their base mm -hmm. and come between, let's say uh, Al-Qaeda would come between ISIS and Israel and start firing at Israel, so Israel would fire back and, hit, wrong people. and hit ISIS. Oh, hit their enemies. And then ISIS would go between Al-Qaeda and Israel, fire at Israel, so Israel would then 
hit Al Qaeda. Yeah. And so you have all these evil people in Syria, right? You, you know, sometimes they present it, you know, that uh, in the West, they present it as um, uh, that the, the rulers of Syria are evil and they're, you know, I mean, they do horrible things. They really do. They took literal barrels that they filled with explosives and tossed them into, into civilian populations uh -huh. because it was a neighborhood that was not accepting the authority of the government of Syria. So let's just kill a bunch of people until they surrender or die. And they when killed, was that? that was, this, that's going on. That's the Syrian civil war. That's been going on for the last something like since over 10 years. How many people have died? Over 600,000. And, and there's nobody, let's say nobody in the Muslim wor world cares apparently. Um, are they not, Muslim? Are they Palestinian? Oh, yeah, no, what no, no. are they? Well, Palestinians as well. But there are all kinds of different Muslims. There's Palestinians, there's um, Shiite Muslims, there are Sunni Muslims, there's something called Alawites. And there's 600,000, there are, are they Muslims that are dying? Mostly Muslims, yeah. There's also Druze, um, so some Druze who have died as well, probably lots. Um, but they're all fighting each other, so there's no good guys in Syria. They're all bad guys. And um, could yeah. this prophecy apply to some one of the groups in Syria? who will, might tomorrow we wake up and find out they took over Damascus? Absolutely, that could be the case. So when we talk about this could be bad guy, when we yeah. say he, okay, so that's a possibility. So we actually don't know. All of these are possibilities of what his rest is. This is one of the, the you know, the parts of Hebrew where, in, in many languages, where you have a pronoun where you say he or him, and it's inherently um, um, ambiguous. Okay. So. All right. All right, let's go on to 9.2. We have Vigam uh, Hamat Tikbal Ba, and also Homs or Hamat will be bordered in her. What does that mean? What that literally means is that Hamat will be part of the border of Israel. Okay. That seems to be what it means. And how far is it right now from the border of Israel? Oh boy, I don't know. I could go look on Google Maps. I um, thought we looked. Is no, it... that was something else. That was Tyre. Oh. We didn't look at Homs. So here's what we would have to do. So I'm pulling this up on Google Maps. Now you can't actually drive from Israel to um, Syria because um, there's a lot of landmines there. But if we go from Homs to the border of Israel, let's maybe because there's caves here. No, no, no. That's that's um that's not oh, that's Syria. Lebanon. Yeah, that's um, okay. So that's, that's um, let's see where see. Ah, here. Okay. So if you wanted to get as close as you could to the border, you would go to Kunetra. Okay. which is inside Syria, and it's 230 kilometers, a three-hour, 13-minute thir drive from um, from Homs to uh, Kunetra, which is in Syria outside of um, the Golan Heights. How many miles is and 230 kilometers? Let's do convert miles to kilometers. So it is, um, it's 143 miles from Hamat, to the current border of Israel. Well, that's a, that's less than from here where we're going. That's less. That's, that's less from Dallas to San Antonio. That's what I was that's, saying. That's closer. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. That's um, two. Yeah, that's like that's like driving to the supermarket in Texas, three and a half hours. <laughs> <laughs> not well, exactly, yeah, but, but not not. But it's if close. it was on a hot, yeah. All yeah. right. Well, so, yeah, because because you're not going seventy miles an hour here. So what does it say about homes? It says. And homes will uh, be bordered in her. Now, what does that mean? It seems like that will be part of Israel. Right. Um, or maybe it will be part of the state of the Antichrist, if, if we go to that direction of the, of the interpretation. Okay. But in any event, um, there's also a play on words here, because tigbal is she will be bordered or she will become part of the border. Um, sounds like the word gval, and gval is another city on the coast of Lebanon. And why do I say another city? Because we have Tzol and Sidon, Tyre and Sidon. Right, and two words before Tyre is Gval or Tigbal. Mm -hmm. Right, so there's a play on words here referring to Gval, which is a city on the coast of. Right, so there's three major cities on the coast of Lebanon. One is being alluded to, and the other two are being mentioned explicitly. Um, and uh, and Gval is an interesting city because the ancient city of Gval. I'm um, looking for it here on the map. Uh, let's see. Where is Gval? Well, it's mentioned throughout the Tanakh. Okay. But the point is, okay, so it's 40 kilometers, um, so like 32 miles north of Beirut. is is They oh. call it today Jebel, but it was a major 
Phoenician city on the border of Lebanon. Oh, okay. And so we have three Phoenician cities that are being, two are mentioned explicitly, Sor and Sidon. Sor is called Tyre, mm -hmm. in, and that's actually the Greek name. In modern times, it's the Arabs still call it Sor, um, which I'm sure I'm mispronouncing. Um, but, um, and then Sidon is um, in Arabic, let's see, I think it's just Sidon or Sidon or something like this. Yeah. Oh, it's called uh, Sida or Saida. Um, Saida is Sidon. And it's a real place today. Yeah. Sor and Sidon are still, Tyre and Sidon are major cities in Lebanon. On the coast. On the coast, right. And they were major um, uh, merchant powers in ancient times. Oh. So uh, Tyre is possibly up until let's say modern, early modern times, mm -hmm. would have been the greatest trading empire the world had ever seen. So it was a superpower. It was a trading superpower, Tyre in particular. Um, Tyre was known for their uh, merchant vessels that went as far as Ireland. Wow. Now, now imagine that. These are uh, merchant vessels that are being rowed by hand wow. by hundreds of people who are rowing by hand and because um, they didn't have the technology, if the wind was against you, you were kind of out of luck. Well. So that's it. You go with the rowing. Um, and uh, they had merchant vessels that reached all the way to Ireland. Um, the Greeks called them the Phoenicians. You've heard of the Phoenicians. The yes. Phoenicians were, didn't call themselves Phoenicians. The Phoenicians called themselves Canaanites. The Greeks called them Phoenicians. I see. And so the Canaanites <clears throat> were the... We've heard of those. We've heard of the Canaanites. We have. And we usually think about the Canaanites who lived in what's today Israel. Right. That we fought against when we came into the land um, in 3500 BCE. So if you say that Israel is an imperialist conquering power, well, maybe not imperialist. If you say we're foreign conquerors, okay. Show me another country where the inhabitants were there 3,500 years ago and we could have a conversation, <laughs> right? I mean, no, think about it. There's not that many countries in the world. No, that's a lot. Of were, time. were the Turks in Turkey 3,500 years ago? No, the Turks weren't there 2,000 years ago, yeah. let alone 3,500 yeah. years ago. They conquered it from the Greeks. Um, <clears throat> so um, when we came to the land, we dealt with the Canaanites, but there were Canaanites that we never conquered because they were kind of far off. They were entire in Sidon. And they weren't, and they were also, uh, they were separated from Israel by mountains, right? So there's, there are these mountains in southern Lebanon that it's pretty hard to conquer, and it's kind of not worth the effort, and it would require being a great naval power, which ancient Israel never really was. Right. Um, when they finally did have a naval presence, uh, King Solomon built ships with the help of the Tyrians, right? So there was Hiram of Tyre, ah. who helped him build, because he didn't know anything about boats. He didn't have people who were trained on boats. So they had the Phoenicians or the Canaanites of Tyre help them. Now, so Tyre and Sidon are playing a part here in Zechariah 9-2 alongside Hamat and maybe the city of Gval, which when it says Hamat will be bordered in it, it's a play on words with Gval. By the way, Gval, which is um, in Greek, it was called Biblos. And, and they were famous in the ancient Greek world for making books. Oh. And the ancient Greek word for a book was Biblia. Bible? And we get, and bi Bible literally just originally meant book. Oh, wow. But it was part of a phrase that oh. meant holy book, right? Um, and so literally, Gval, because they were so famous for making books, is where we get the, the word Bible from, because it was called Biblos um, in, uh, in Greek. So if we're talking about Tyre, yeah. Yeah. Um, they went as far as Ireland, but... Didn't they also have colonies like... All over the Mediterranean. The city of Marseille was founded by the, by the Tyrians. Wow. Right? I mean, th we think of that as a French city. But before the French invaders came... Uh, <laughs> in, no, really, the French are foreign invaders who conquered okay, Gaul it's true, it's true. From, okay. um, from the indigenous population. And right, they were Franks. They actually conquered it from the Romans, not from the indigenous population, who had conquered it from the Gauls. Um, but southern France was colonized originally by the Tyrians, by the people of Sor, of Tyre, and in Marseille in particular was a, was a colony they established. Um, and then they, when, they came, when they came to Spain, they saw rabbits there, and they called Spain the land of the rabbits. Now, here's something, what is, we, need, what is that word? Here, here's something we have to know about, about the Phoenicians, about the Canaanites. The Canaanites spoke a language very similar to Hebrew. 
In fact, there are words that if you write them out in Hebrew letters, they're essentially Hebrew. Oh, wow. And now you have to put in vowels because the way they spelled it was a little bit differently. And the way they pronounced it might have been very different. We don't know. Mm -hmm. We have no idea how they pronounced it. We, we actually have some Roman sources that transcribe um, Canaanite Phoenician words, um, but those are in a relatively late period. And then when a foreigner hears something, he doesn't always write it down correctly. So take those with a grain of salt. Um, so uh, if you looked at the names of some of the uh, the Phoenician Canaanite uh, rulers, you would say, oh, those are Hebrew names. Oh. So, for example, who's the most famous um, uh, Phoenician or Canaanite in all of history? Hannibal. That's only because I told you that, right? That's the only reason I know. <laughs> Hannibal Barca. It's, okay. it's somewhere in our in my notes. Yeah. yeah. So Hannibal is, that is the most right. So he came with elephants into famously Hannibal invaded Italy with elephants, and they died crossing over the Alps. Most of the elephants, um, maybe all the elephants, I don't remember. And most of his, a lot of his men died as well. So, um, so the, the Phoenicians um, or the Canaanites, they had this guy named Hannibal. And what is Hannibal in their language? He was called Hannibal. And Hannibal is actually just the name Hananiah, but for the religion of the Canaanites. So Hananiah means Yehovah has grace, has mercy. And there's a, a related name in Hebrew, which is Hanan El. God has mercy. El oh, has mercy. Okay. But if you worship Baal, then you're Hani Baal. Zerubbabel? Baal has no, no. That's something. That's okay. Zerubbabel. That's oh, that's okay. Un unrelated. Um, Hani Baal means Baal has mercy. Okay. Right. So why is that a Hebrew name? Because the Phoenicians spoke a language that was very similar to Hebrew. Um, why is for a different discussion. So, but you were saying that they had rabbits in Spain. Right. And so when they came to Spain, they called it Eretz, and they didn't know what rabbits were, but they had an a, a animal similar to rabbits in the land of Canaan, which is called a hyrax in modern times. Oh, I have videos of those. They're, They're really, really cute, cute little guys. And they, and, they, and they kind of chew on stuff like the rabbit, like, like that little chewing. And it's described in the Torah as chewing its cud. What they're actually chewing is, can I say it? They no. They, they poop don't and then they me. eat their poop. I don't want to know. They're too cute. Because the first time they so they cute. the food passes through their digestive system, it can't fully be um, absorbed. Oh. So they eat. Um, it's not exactly poop, right? It's semi-digested okay. semi right. food, which they eat again and chew on, and then they digest it a second time. So um, both rabbits and hyraxes do it. So they called it the land of hyrax because the, the rabbits they weren't familiar with reminded them of hyraxes. And the word for hyrax or rabbit is shafan. Okay. And so they called it Eretz HaShafan in Hebrew. It would be Eretz HaShafan. In uh, Phoenician, it was called probably something like um, Arad uh, uh, HaShafan or something like that. Right? We don't know exactly. We have guesses of how they pronounced it. Like the show was probably something like Th, maybe. In any event, um, so, and that's where you get the name Hispania. Hispania is Hashafan, the Hyrax or the rabbit, so, the land of the rabbits. So the point is these Tyrians were all over the world. That's important for understanding this right, prophecy because right. he's talking about the superpower here. They build a fortress and they have silver like dust and fine gold like mud in the streets. What are we talking about? There's some economic superpower, which is a trading superpower. It goes all the way to Ireland with their trade and they have colonies as far away as Spain. The most famous colony of the Phoenicians, of the people of Tyre, was Carthage. And Carthage was known as New Tyre. Oh, okay. And when Tyre was finally conquered by Alexander the Great, um, they were cut off from the, um, well, actually, they were conquered by the Persians before that. When they were finally conquered, they were cut off from the, the colony of Carthage, of New Tyre, was cut off from the motherland, and it became an independent country, an independent city-state. And then it took over a lot of the Carthaginian, excuse me, it took over, Carthage took over a lot of the um, Phoenician colonies. And that's how Carthage became this great superpower hmm. in the Western Mediterranean that then later fought the Romans. And what made the Romans an, a great empire, what led to them becoming a great empire, was, was defeating Carthage. Right. When they finally defeated Carthage, they then ruled Spain and southern France, and eventually they ruled what today is Tunisia, where Carthage was located. Wow. 
uh, which and actually the 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 name for Carthage, the region in which Carthage was called was Africa. That's what they called it, Africa, and uh, that's what the um, the Romans called it. The Phoenicians didn't call it Africa. And by the way, Africa didn't originally refer to the continent. It only referred to the area around Carthage. Wow. And it comes from the Hebrew, which is also Canaanite word, afav, which is dust, the land of dust. So much goes back to Hebrew. Yeah. So much yeah. goes back to Hebrew. So Africa comes from the Hebrew word afav, which means dust, um, the land of the, the soil, the dust. So now we can see why they're talking about higher yeah. amassing the silver like dust. Yeah, because the they're a massive like empire. Mud. But now, now here we have to ask a question, and I don't know the answer. It's a question. So this is a future prophecy. How do I know it's a future prophecy? Because it ends with, well, we'll see how it ends. It ends with what's clearly a messianic year. Right, that I, that I get. But right here is <clears throat> we're talking. Well, and so here, the question I have here for verse 2 and 3, is this talking about Tyre in ancient times? Or is it talking about Tyre in the future? Right now, Tyre is... Um, a third world country. They li- an so, impoverished oh, it, country right now. Incredibly impoverished. Here's how bad it is in Lebanon, because Tyre's part of Lebanon. Right. In Lebanon, people rob banks to get their own money out of the bank. Oh, you said that before. And that's not an exaggeration. They literally go to the bank and they say, sorry, we can't give you your money. We can't afford it. So people will go rob the bank and say, I'm not trying to steal money. I want my money. That's how bad it is in Lebanon. So, so how do we go from that today to Tyre building up a fortification, Amassing silver like dust and well, fine gold like the mud of the streets. So is that ancient tire or is that tire in the future a thousand years from why now? Why can't it be? Why can't it? Why can't part of this prophecy have already been fulfilled and we're waiting for the rest? I mean, why it can't absolutely it? could be. Okay. It's also possible that here tire that the pshat is an allegory. That in other words, it's not literally tire. Whenever this prophecy comes to pass, let's say it's in the year you know five years from now or next week. Or a thousand years from now, I have no idea. But when it's fulfilled, maybe it will be the tire of that generation. Right? And what is the tire of this generation? The tire of this, who is the international economic trading superpower? China. Right. Go anywhere in the world. They have the Road and Belt Initiative. Right? They have literally um, uh, ships going out all over the world, a large percentage of world shipping trade, because that's what tire was. It was a shipping empire, is China. Um, so maybe t- this refers to China, or maybe it refers literally to Tyre, which will have a resurgence a thousand years from now, and will be a major economic power. I have no, or it's or, like you said, or maybe, that part was fulfilled yeah. in ancient times, and another part's going to be fulfilled in the future. That's possible. Right. I mean, you can look at it any way, any of those that you'd like. I'm just looking at it now, and I mean. And we don't know, so all those are possibilities. Right. Verse 4, behold, Adonai will disinherit it, and he will smite in the sea her wealth. And she, meaning Tyre, will be consumed with fire. So that happened in ancient times. Tyre was eventually conquered, and Carthage was left, right? The, the little colony, maybe not a little colony, the, the distant uh, backwater colony became the center of an empire because the motherland was conquered. Um, mm. So maybe that's something that happened. Maybe that definitely happened in ancient times. Right. But maybe it's referring to something that's going to happen in the future to China, or to some other country that we can that doesn't even have a name yet. What if it refers in the future? We okay. don't know. So Tyre is what eighteen miles from the border of Israel right now. Yeah, right? It, it's less than a half hour drive. If there were and, people firing rockets at you, I mean that's what's happening today. I mean being consumed. I mean that that could be today as well. Am I wrong? Oh, I mean in the second Lebanon War, uh, Tyre and the first Lebanon War, Tyre was very badly damaged. Um, in the next war, it could be completely flattened, but it doesn't right. have a massive. So here it says, and he struck in the in the sea her wealth, and she, what does that refer to? She doesn't have too much wealth. Well, she doesn't now, and she certainly doesn't have silver and um, and and gold no, like it's, dust. No, so, but but verse four says, but mm-hmm. but my lord, I don't know. It's I don't know. Yeah, will disinherit her, impoverish her. Right. Well, it doesn't disinherit. say disinherit. He'll he'll disinherit her, right? So whoever's living there will. It does be, say will, disinherit. It does say this. Yeah, so, right. so what that means is somebody's the heir of that land, and they lose the rights to that land, and it's given to somebody else. That's what the word means. So let's just wait. And so see someone else will inherit that land. Right. Someone else will inherit the land. He will defeat her forces yeah. at sea, and she herself will be consumed by fire. Okay. Yeah. Um, so it's either the literal tire or 
the spiritual tire, the, the future metaphorical tire, the current metaphorical tire, perhaps. Okay. Some great trading empire. You going to five? Let's go to five. Ashkelon will see and be afraid. Come in, Ashkelon. I know where Ashkelon is. Yeah. I've been to Israel. It's in Israel, yeah. right? It's in southern Israel, yeah. So tell me the about coast. the history of Ashkelon. So there were five Canaanite cities, and this brings us to the Palestine prophecy, oh. right? <laughs> this part of the prophecy is about the Philistines. and But here it only says Ashkelon. It doesn't say anything about the Philistines. Okay, why do we say Philistines and Palestinians? Are we talking? Well, let, let's say that. Let's right. talk about the historical Philistines. Okay, the historical Philistines. So the Philistines. historical Philistines, before we get to the Palestinians of today, the historical Philistines um, had what's called a pentapolis, or a five-city, there were five city-states, and each one of those city-states was like a little kingdom. And the five city-states were, uh, and they were all in the southwestern area of Israel in the coastal region, mm -hmm. Ashkelon, Gaza, or Aza, Ekron, Gath, and Ashdod. And the most famous Philistine, of course, is Goliath, right. who's called Goliath Hagiti, the Gittite, right? So he's from Gat. That's what he means. He's a Gittite. Okay. Um, <clears throat> we have Achish, the king of Gat, who okay. uh, David is living with. Oh, right, right. When he was pretending to be crazy. Yeah. Okay. Um, you have, um, so, so we have different um, Philistines who are mentioned in the Tanakh. And then uh, David has this group of Philistines who are his loyal allies, who are his fierce warriors, this ba two bands of Philistines who are called the Crete and the Plate. And that's really interesting because Crete means the Cretans. And Plate is the Pletans. Now, what are the Pletans? I don't know. But the Cretans were from Crete. And that's a bit strange because the Philistines, you would have this pentapolis of five cities. Yeah. But some of them are from Crete. And then they have kind of strange names. But, you know, the, the Canaanites, remember I told you, spoke a language very similar to Hebrew. Mm -hmm. um, so much so that if I wrote it out with vowels in Hebrew letters, you could a lot it. of Israelis could read it. Um, I could say 20 years ago that most Israeli high school kids could read it, but I think that's not the case anymore. Their education has, uh, um, is, isn't as classical as it used to be. Um, <laughs> so, um, but it's very similar to Hebrew. The Philistine language is completely different. When we look at a name like Goliath, mm -hmm. which is Goliath, that doesn't even sound like a Semitic name. And then you have Achish. That's also not a Semitic name. Both of those names are in what are called Indo-European languages. They have the case endings that you would find in Greece, uh, in Greek. So in Greek, a lot of words end in us. And that's what's called Zeus. a case, like Zeus, right? Zeus is, is Zeus. Um, and... And so, um, so it seems from what we know of the Philistine uh, names that they were an Indo-European people. And some of them apparently came from Crete because they're called the Cretans. And Ashkelon is an interesting name. Some historians say Ashkelon refers to the place where the people who settled in Ashkelon came from. And that place was called something like Shakala. And they say, oh, that's Sicily, Sicilia. Oh. So they were invaders from Sicily. And the word Philistine itself, Plishtim, are you ready for well, Before we get to what Philistine means. So there were five, these five cities, and they are, we can see that in the story of the Ark. Remember, they returned the Ark, and they had these plagues that happened. Right, right. And so they sent back five golden, it says, um, what does it say in the English? It's like five golden hemorrhoids, I think it says. <laughs> But they weren't hemorrhoids. They were the boils of the Black Plague. And how do we know that? Because it says there was a plague there in, in the different Philistine cities that the Ark went. Oh, right, right, and, right. A, and what kind of plague was it? Well, we, we can see from the story they sent five golden mice. So they saw mice dying, and they thought the mice are giving them the plague. And that's the Black Plague, right? What in the Middle Ages was called the Black Plague or some form of the Black right. Plague. Um, they associated with mice because what okay. happens we think today, or we know today, I should say, I'm not sure which one, um, uh, the um, fleas bite the mice, the mice die, then the fleas go looking for something else to bite, and they bite people. And people see dead mice, and they associate the plague with... They I think, see. They think the mice gave it to them, or the rats. So they send five golden mice, one for each of the five Philistine cities, Ashkelon, Aza, Ekron, Gath, and Ashdod. And then uh, they have five golden... Um, boils of the Black Plague, one for each of the five cities. So these five cities were called Plishtim, 
Philistines, and the plishtim come from the Hebrew word palash, which means invader. So Philistine literally comes from the word that means invader. And um, actually the literal meaning of palash is to penetrate. And, and we looked this up in the dictionaries. It's really a, a beautiful uh, illustration of linguistically of what it means. So it talks about an etrog, that's a citron. Right. And a citron that is um, pierced, but not fully penetrated to where the, the, the hole reaches the inside of the flesh of the citron. Citron's like a giant it's lemon. It's a fruit. Right. It's a type of lemon, sort of. Well, it's related to the lemon. It smells amazing. It, yeah. It doesn't taste too good, but it smells It tastes really very good, good if you candy it. Yeah, sure, if you candy it. But um, anyway, so, so the word for to fully penetrate is palash. And palash means an invader. So the plishtim are invaders. Were the invaders. Now, why were they called invaders? Because they invaded from the West. And they're referred to and, and also um, visually um, presented and shown in, um, in Egyptian sources. So the Egyptians show them, uh, they call them the Sea Peoples in the Egyptian sources. And why are they called the Sea Peoples? Because they invaded Egypt from the sea. And they come into Egypt and they fight against the Egyptians and they're shown with this certain type of hat that has these feathers, the feathered hat. And we see those feathered hats when we excavate archeology span in the area around Gaza, in the Philistine sites. We see that, that they, um, they have um, a sarcophagi that is um, uh, sort of coffins made of clay and the clay coffins, you can see them in the Israel Museum, at least as of uh, recently, they may move them, but you walk into the Israel Museum to the archeology span section, you see these Philistine um, coffins made of clay and they have the Sea People's Hat that we know from the Egyptian um, drawings. And so the conclusion archaeologists made is that the Philistines are sea peoples okay. who invaded from the Mediterranean. Some of them apparently came from Sicily. Some of them came from the Aegean, um, like Crete. Crete is part of the Aegean, the Greek area. And what happened is there was a, um, this is what they believe happened. We don't know for sure exactly why it happened. But the explanation of archaeologists is that um, there was a, a volcanic eruption on the island of Santorini, okay. also known as Thera or Terra, right. and most of the island exploded and it caused number one ash, uh, but also it, it, ash in the sky that caused all kinds of... Um, um, Things to die when it does well, that? You no, know, it caused all kinds of, um, what's the word, climatic problems, right. right? So all of a sudden you didn't have, you know, you would lose summer. That's what I'm right? saying. A lot of and you'd have a very cold winter. We, yes, exactly. And crops fail. Right. And there's a tidal wave. And it causes the collapse of what's known as the Minoan civilization. That I mean archaeology is called the Minoan civilization. Okay. And that leads to all these people who are then, okay, my, my island was destroyed. Now I'm looking for a place to settle. And I drive out the people from Crete. And the people from Crete are looking for a place to settle, and they invade Egypt and southern Israel. And that's where the Philistine invaders, right? The Canaanites apparently called them invaders before the Israelites because they had invaded from the Western, uh, from the West, uh, from the Mediterranean, the Egyptians called them sea peoples. So the Philistines are invaders, not native to the land of Israel. And that's why they have these Indo-European names. You have been listening to Hebrew Voices with Nehemia Gordon. Thank you for supporting Nehemia's Makor Hebrew Foundation. Learn more at nehemiaswall.com.